Have you ever wondered what it would look like if you mixed the One Piece world with the Pokemon world? Oda's already ahead of us on that because of the ancient weapons. These are said to be three legendary tools powerful enough to destroy the planet. But when we say tools, we're not talking about an inanimate object like a screwdriver or a hammer. Look at Shirahoshi, she's from the fish category of animals but she's still sentient. And during Gadatsu's cover story, we even had a mole that was labeled as an earth boss. He wore a helmet with the Japanese flag and Mount Fuji on it in order to foreshadow how Pluton was going to be beneath Wano. And the Wano port that's nearest Pluton is Mogura port. Mogura is the Japanese word for mole. The reason why Oda's putting so much emphasis on moles is because Pluton is a mole. And when it comes to the identity and the personification of Uranus, I believe he'll be sentient too. With all three of the ancient weapons being sentient, a much more fitting title for this trio is the Ancient Beast. A fish, a mole, and a bird. It's almost as if Oda bases ancient weapons off of one of the most popular video games of all time. Shirahoshi being Kyogre, Pluton being Groudon, and Uranus being Rayquaza. The best part about this all is we haven't even reached the spiciest details. But before we jump into that, make sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to never miss the sickest One Piece theory videos on all of YouTube. Now when it comes to the ancient weapons, the basic premise is that these are three really powerful tools that the world can use. It is said that they are tools of mass destruction and they can wipe out entire islands or civilizations. Our first glimpse of this was in the Alabasta arc when Crocodile threatened to capture Pluton. It's labeled as a warship that has the power and the ability to eradicate entire islands. And this was even the same ancient weapon that Frankie grew up fearing, a tremendously powerful warship. And then you have the case of Shirahoshi, who's basically a really big mermaid. She has the power of Poseidon, which is the ability to control the Sea Kings. A power like that in the wrong hands can spell disaster for many countries and islands around the world. But to refocus back onto Shirahoshi, she's technically under the merfolk category which would make her a fishman. So knowing that Shirahoshi is a fishman, that means the ancient weapon of Poseidon is in the fishman category, which means that the ancient weapon of Poseidon is already animalistic. She would basically be the power of the ocean or fish personified. And this would make sense because the word Poseidon is deeply related and connected to the ocean. So with Shirahoshi being a master of the ocean and all the many creatures inside of it, it makes sense why she has the role of Poseidon. And as far as Uranus goes, it's actually a much more difficult case because there's less concrete evidence to work with. But we do have stuff from real life mythologies that will lead us to a good answer for Uranus. With that out of the way, let's explain why the ancient weapon of Pluton is going to be animalistic, or more importantly, a mole. As wild as that sounds, it's easily one of the best One Piece theories I've ever heard. And huge shout out to Dak Sake on YouTube because he's the legend that came up with this theory. Like when I first heard the conclusion Pluton is a mole, I was like, oh, it's going to be a reach. It's going to be nonsense. But no, it actually makes a lot of sense. Hear me out. When the Straw Hats defeated NL and his men, one of them, specifically the man named Gadatsu, ended up falling into the blue planet. When he landed onto the ground, he actually began his own cover story which is jam-packed with Pluton information. But basically, Gadatsu was walking around and he ends up meeting this old man. Gadatsu eventually starts digging because the old man is running a hot springs business. But out of nowhere, out of the blue, Gadatsu startles a giant mole. Now in this moment, Oda actually named that mole the legendary boss of the earth. And this is something to be questioned. If this was some random mole that did not matter to the story, you would have to ask why Oda would give him such a grandiose name. Like really? Legendary boss of the earth? That's way too extravagant for something that would not matter. So the reason why Oda gave it such an extravagant name is because it does matter. Let me explain. On that mole's helmet is a Japanese flag and what appears to be Mount Fuji. Now from the lens of a One Piece fan, there's one important thing we know about Japan and Mount Fuji. And it's the fact that it's represented in the story with the country and arc of Wano. We even had a mountain in Wano that was literally named Mount Fuji, which is clearly based off of the mountain in Japan. Now if we think about Wano and its entire landscape, including Mount Fuji, we know at the end of the Wano arc, we learned something huge. We learned that way beneath Wano and Mount Fuji lies the ancient weapon of Pluton. Now if we connect that giant mole we saw earlier to the ancient weapon of Pluton, we notice a simple connection. That mole in Gadatsu's cover story was underground because Gadatsu was far down digging. So basically, Oda used this mole in chapter 314 to foreshadow how Pluton was going to be beneath Wano. Now it doesn't stop there. You might be thinking that Pluton doesn't have to be a mole. Maybe that mole was used to foreshadow how Pluton was going to be beneath Wano. Well what if I told you that there 
is great reasons as to why Pluton has to be a mole. If you think about Wano and its only legal port for entering the country, you notice it's called Mogura port. The Japanese word for Moga translates directly to the English word mole. It's very weird for Oda to go so far out of his way to do that. Like this is the same port that's closest to Pluton. It has a secret waterfall entrance. It's simply because Pluton's going to be a mole. But you also have the fact that Baroque Works was an evil faction stationed in Alabasta. They even had a member in their squad named Drophy and she was the one with the mole mole devil fruit. The craziest thing about her is the fact that she's labeled as a town destroyer. I believe this is reminiscent of how Pluton as an ancient weapon is labeled as an island destroyer. Oda made these two different items relate because one is foreshadowing the other. Oda used a mole woman to foreshadow the concept of Pluton being a mole. And it ties in even better when you think about how Gadatsu's mole dug from Hot Springs Island to Alabasta. Why is Oda making such a big emphasis on moles, especially with Alabasta? That's a huge red flag considering that it was also Alabasta that introduced the ancient weapon Pluton in the first place. So at this point, you should start seeing all these different connections, all this emphasis on moles and Alabasta, which simultaneously had something to do with the ancient weapon Pluton. But let's actually take a step back and let's reshift our focus. Let's think about Wano for a second. You have to question why that Wano port is called Mole and why it even has a secret waterfall entrance. I believe the reason for that is because Oda's using this port to foreshadow how Pluton's a mole. So that sounds all pretty along with all the other details we had, but what would that actually look like? What would Pluton as a mole look like to us readers? I think the simple and extravagant answer is Groudon. This is a legendary creature from the Pokemon franchise and is one of the most powerful Pokemon of all time. Groudon actually owns the domain of the Earth and the Underworld, so that would actually fit the dynamic of something like Pluton. And even just looking at Groudon, you can see the spikes that come off of his hands and his face. He kind of gives me the impression of a really cool mole. But wait a second, when you actually think about it, Groudon's a part of a legendary trio just like how Pluton is. In that legendary trio, you have Kyogre, Rayquaza, and Groudon. Kyogre owns the domain of the sea, Groudon owns the domain of the earth, and Rayquaza owns the domain of the sky. So what if the three ancient weapons in One Piece are based off of these legendary Pokemon? You could use a video game like Pokemon Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald, because again, in that game, it was a legendary trio of Kyogre, Groudon, and Rayquaza. The game developers actually had that theme in mind when they designed them like that. They are labeled as the Weather Trio, because one is our Earth boss, one is a Sea boss, and one is a Sky boss. Now comparing that to the ancient weapons, doesn't it seem like a familiar style? Now let's actually think about the names of the ancient weapons. Poseidon, Pluton, and Uranus. It's very clear that their name scheme is actually based off of Greek mythology. We know that there's gods that correspond to these ancient weapons, it's pretty self-explanatory. But just because their name is based off of a Greek god, I don't think their appearance has to be based off of a Greek god either. Because you have ancient weapons like Shirahoshi who is clearly not based off of the ancient god in terms of appearance. So when it comes to something like Pluton, I think it could look like a mole, or Uranus could even end up looking like a bird. But more importantly, their design schemes based off of the legendary trio from Pokemon Emerald, Kyogre, Groudon, and Rayquaza. Now through the process of elimination, it's pretty clear that Uranus is going to be based off of Rayquaza. But I don't think that Uranus is going to be a dragon per se. I think Uranus could be more of a hawk or some kind of bird. And the reason for that is actually information from Elbaf and Norse mythology. We already know that Elbaf is largely based off of Norse culture. We know people like Shanks have a deep affiliation with Elbaf and that helps the case too. Because Shanks is most likely based off of Tyr from Norse mythology, the one-handed swordsman with red hair. Shanks also sails on a Bracker ship, which is straight from Norse mythology. The land landscape and the architecture of Elbaf is also similar to that of Viking culture, even down to the way people dress and the design of their ships. So comparing something like Elbaf to say Wano, it's pretty clear what Oda's goal is. Oda prefers to have his islands and his main kingdoms be based off of real life places. That's why we have islands like Water 7 where it's clearly based off of something like Italy. This is a common writing pattern for Oda and it's going to be displayed with Elbaf being based off of Norse culture. Now that's pretty much the case for Elbaf as a whole, but let's key in and focus on the tree of of Elbaf. It's been shown in numerous shots of Elbaf just kind of lurking in the background, just like what Oda was doing with Mount Fuji and Wano. I think that tree in Elbaf is going to play a huge role in the story, and I think it's even going to be based off of a specific tree in Norse culture. The Tree of Yggdrasil, the Tree of Many Worlds. Now, the Tree of Yggdrasil is most likely the inspiration to the Elbaf tree. We know that the tree is actually said to have multiple groups of animals living in it. There's animals like a dragon named Nyagr, they even have stags, which are also known as deer, but more importantly, the tree 
has a hawk named Fjörfolnir who sits on top of an unnamed eagle. And that unnamed eagle is actually listed as a sky god in their mythology. So now when you take a step back and you look at Elbaf from a broad point of view, or if you pull out the microscope and look at Elbaf, it's very clear that Norse culture is going to play a heavy role in that arc. And again, part of that Norse mythology has a humongous tree named Yggdrasil, which Oda was inspired to create the Elbaf tree from. And on that Elbaf tree will most likely be an unnamed eagle from Norse mythology. But if you'd like, there's actually a slightly different route you could take with all this bird stuff. A Thunderbird. The Thunderbird is a figure from Native American mythology and it's described as a supernatural being. The enormous bird symbolized power and strength and protected humans from evil spirits. I think this could apply to the ancient weapon of Uranus because maybe it's a sentient eagle that protects his friends and protects his comrades. And when you look at the totem poles from real life that are based on Thunderbirds, it's actually very similar to the totem poles that we saw on Skypiea. So there exists a possibility that the culture of Skypiea and Shandora are foreshadowing a Thunderbird being in One Piece. And that Thunderbird in One Piece could be the ancient weapon Uranus. Another reason why Uranus is going to be a bird is actually because of Chopper. During Chopper's time skip period, we know that he went to an island named Torino Kingdom. On this island, it was filled with primevals and even a massively tall tree. These primevals had their own library, but they were controlled by the birds on the tree. I think that island, Torino Kingdom, is actually foreshadowing Elbaf and the ancient weapon Uranus. And this is because I believe Oda's comparing these primevals to the Elbaf Vikings, then the primitive library to the library of Ohara, then the tall tree on Torino Kingdom to the tall tree on Elbaf, and finally the birds on Torino's tree to the ancient weapon Uranus on Elbaf. And that's another reason why Uranus is going to be some form of a bird that owns the domain of the sky. Now onto the powers of a thunderbird. We know that they can shoot lightning through their eyes which is pretty insane and they could use their wings to issue thunder. This honestly sounds like the animal version of NL but to be honest I'd rank this ancient weapon higher than NL. But yeah basically the ancient weapon Uranus might have the ability to create thunder and lightning and he would own the domain of the sky. Kind of like how Shirahoshi owns the domain of the sea. The craziest part about this all is it finally answers one big question. The egg. Roger's egg. This theory answers that question because I believe that egg on Roger's ship is the ancient weapon Uranus. If you think back to when Roger had that egg on his ship, we know one event took place during that time, Ed War. This was that battle between Roger and Shiki where the storm kind of saved Roger. But if we key into the dialogue that was exchanged between Roger and Shiki, we know that Shiki said something huge. He told Roger, I know you have the ancient weapon. You have it somewhere in your possession. Knowing that Roger had this gigantic egg on his ship at the same time when this conversation was taking place, it seems like that's a classic Oda move. Have a character refer to something while it's being shown to the reader. Now you're probably wondering, okay, what happened to the egg then? Where did it go? I believe Roger owned this egg, obviously, and he passed it on to none other than Shanks. We know Shanks was a former Roger pirate and he even had a secret conversation with Roger that might have had something to do with the ancient weapon. So I could see Shanks eventually dropping that egg off on Elbaf and eventually becoming friends with the people of that island. That would mean that the former Roger pirate, now Yonko, red hair Shanks, is in the possession of Uranus. And this most likely means that the three ancient weapons of One Piece are all animalistic and they're all going to be based off of the weather trio from Pokemon Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald. Kyogre, Groudon, and Rayquaza, the ancient beasts of the One Piece world. And I would even go as far as to argue that having these legendary creatures or legendary beasts in your shonen manga is actually commonplace. Think of Oda's best friend Masashi Kishimoto, the author of Naruto. In his story, he had demonic animals called the Tailed Beasts who could destroy all types of civilizations. So something like the ancient weapons in One Piece all being animalistic would be thematic to me. And that's because the ancient weapons are actually ancient beasts. And Pirate King Monkey D. Luffy is going to be the ultimate beast tamer. So not only is Luffy going to become the Pirate King, he's also going to become the Pokemon World Champion. 